Hey everyone, we are just gonna wait a couple minutes before we get started and let everyone kind of filter in. And also, if you guys would like to take this time, uh, we invite you all to introduce yourself in the chat. Just type your name and your affiliation if you would like to. I'm Bill Kaplan, and uh, I work, I'm a docent at the Center. Hi, Bill. Thanks for joining us today. I am seeing some other introductions Introductions in the chat. Again, if you guys want to use this time to write in a quick chat about your affiliation, I'm still letting people in. Or we are at 40, 49 participants right now. I know we had quite a few more registered, so we'll just give it a few more minutes before we get started. Hey, Sarah, I just made it. Computer let me <laughs> join. <laughs> All right, we will maybe give it one more minute and then you think I'll get started at 105. I just turned the waiting room off so you don't have to monitor that anymore. So welcome everyone. I know for some of us, so I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm Karina Nielsen, Director of Oregon Sea Grant. Um, several folks on this meeting, I know we're just in an earlier meeting that went all morning. So appreciate seeing your faces again. Um, between that meeting and this meeting, my computer decided it needed to update, so. I made it in the nick of time. Um, if folks would like, as they're um, as they're joining, um, please uh, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, just sit, write your name and uh, maybe your affiliation if you'd like. Um, we won't have time to go around to everyone. We already have fifty nine folks in the room. We had close, you know, over hundred registrants. So uh, we'll see. Uh, it's a pretty packed room. We're excited to have you all here. Um, I want to take a second to introduce um, Sarah Sweat, uh, who was talking to you earlier. She's our uh, latest um, um, staff member to join our extension faculty at um, Sea Grant, Oregon Sea Grant. And uh, she is a specialist um, on renewable marine energy and communities. And she is co-leading this um, session with me. Um, Let's see, I think we're good enough. Do you want to start the slides, Sarah? We'll start yeah, the formal introduction. Let me get it started and people can. We'll introduce other ahead. folks as we go along here who are presenting, et cetera. Yep. All right. Great. Um, yeah, you can go ahead and move to the next the first real slide. Um, so in welcoming everyone, uh, we also, this is a big room. There's a lot of people. Um, we wanted to just review some, uh, basically say by joining this meeting, um, we um, we 
are assuming you will agree to some basic terms to uh, a basic and meeting contract to honor the agenda, which we'll show you again, uh, to honor the learning goal, um, to be respectful of different opinions and perspectives, to please ask questions and participate respectfully, to please introduce yourself briefly when you speak, and to be mindful of your speaking time so that everyone can participate. Um, so thank you for that. Go on to the next slide. Um, we want you to ask questions and participate in the discussion. There are two parts to our presentation today and to the webinar today. Um, the first part is uh, presentations by some of our invited guests who have uh, who are bringing great information in about community benefit um, agreements. We ask, we have set aside maybe a couple of minutes at the end of each presentation for folks to ask any clarifying questions about the presentations. You can either type your question into the chat um, or use the raise hand function. And at the end of the presentation, we'll call on a few folks, time permitting, uh, to ask those clarifying questions. This isn't the time to start a discussion though. Um, and after the presentations, the second part, which is the second hour, um, that'll be our participatory, participatory engaged conversation, questions, answers, discussion, um, take a slightly different approach. And we'll put these instructions in the chat again. You can use the raise hand function if you want to speak out loud. You can use, there's a Q&A function. Uh, you should see, and I'll show you what the icons look like in a later slide. If you want to write in anonymously, um, we'll address those uh, in the order received. If you have um, a desire to add to the current topic under conversation and you're like at the end of the queue, um, we ask that you use the chat and just put a letter Q in it and the moderator will try and call on you before we shift to the next topic. Cause I know sometimes it's hard to wait all the way to the end when you have a comment specific to the topic at hand. So those are the rules for the road. We'll put them in the chat again and make those accessible to you there in a few minutes. We'll show them again before we get into the discussion. Um, just as where do I find these things? Um, at the bottom of your screen, you should see something like the ribbon I've cut and pasted here. The Q&A has the two little comment bubbles. The chat has the single comment bubble. And the raise hand is either a separate thing or icon, or it might be under your reactions. Um, so those are where you'll find those. And then our learning goal for today is to increase for everybody, including us, we've been coming up to speed pretty quickly ourselves, Sarah and I, uh, together with all of you, to increase our understanding of community benefit agreements and their relevance to the specific uh, BOEM, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, offshore wind bidding leasing development process. Um, so that's our goal for today. And I guess, oh, maybe I should just say before I go onto the agenda, that really our goal here is learning and sharing information. Um, it's not a public process for testimony um, and that kind of thing. It's really, we wanna learn together. So please keep that in mind. We are not a body that takes public comment and delivers it anywhere or can do anything with it per se. So just to remind everybody, there are other places um, where those comments will be more effective. Thank you. Um, so our agenda, we've, uh, I'm going to pass it off in a minute to Sarah to continue the introductions of our presenters. Um, we have two primary speakers today, Miltilda uh, Crater from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and Catherine Hoff from the University of California, the Berkeley Center for Law, Energy, and Environment. And they've both been studying and investigating um, community benefit agreements for a while now, and some work under their belts. Um, we will also have a little, um, she's not on the agenda, but for a minute, uh, one of our OSU researchers, uh, Hilary Boudet, uh, will tell you a little bit about, just for a second, a project she's working on, and then we'll have the hour of Q&A and discussion. Um, and I think this is the point at which I go ahead. Uh, oh, one more thing I wanted to mention that are, we have a couple of people from Sea Grant online, if you need help with tech or anything like that. Um, Susie Connolly, let's see here if I can, um, I'm going to, um, she's online here, you can uh, chat with her. Um, I'm, I'm going to call out Amanda Gladix, maybe just wave your hand. 
She can also help you in the background. Um, those from those of us who are not presenting, maybe Jamie Doyle. Anyway, any one of those three can perhaps help you uh, in the background if needed. So thanks for being here with us. And Sarah, I'll let you take it away now. Yeah, thank you, Karina. So hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Sweat. And like Karina said, I recently started here at Oregon Sea Grant, and I am the Marine Renewable Energy and Communities Extension Specialist. So very excited to be here and to be putting this on and having you all join us. So I'm just going to give a little bit of context to kind of why we're holding this today and what's going on in Oregon with offshore wind. And a lot of you guys may already be familiar of where we are in the process, but this is just a little refresher. So in February of this year, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, which I'll probably be referring to them as BOEM going forward, finalized two wind energy areas off the coast of Oregon. And this May, the proposed sale notice and the draft environmental assessment were both published. Today, we're going to be focusing mostly on the proposed sale notice, which currently has an open public comment period that extends until July 1. And right here, we have a QR code and a link that brings you to that federal register posting with the proposed sale notice. So what this means is that BOEM has proposed to hold a lease sale and offer one or more lease areas for commercial wind power development on the outer continental shelf off the coast of Oregon. And this proposed sale notice document is specific to the Oregon wind energy areas, and it has information about the areas available for leasing, lease provisions and conditions, details about the auction and procedures for lease award appeals and lease execution. So it, it has a lot of information in it for potential bidders, but it also has a lot of information that's really important for all of us to recognize and understand. So how does this document, the proposed sale notice, fit into BOEM's leasing timeline? Like I said, the public comment period for the proposed sale notice is open until July 1st. After July 1st, BOEM will begin to review all of those comments that were submitted in response to the proposed sale notice, and they'll start to prepare the final sale notice by updating the proposed sale notice with any new information and input from public comments. And then BOEM will publish the final sale notice in the Federal Register at least 30 calendar days before the date of the lease auction. And BOEM has projected that they're gonna hold the auction in October of this year. So we can expect that the final sale notice is gonna be published sometime in September of this year. And we will note that there will be no public comment period associated with the final sale notice, which is why it's very important if you wanna submit public comment to BOEM, about the sale notice that you get it done before July 1st. And we know that it is kind of a short deadline, but you know we've got 15 days and that's why we're all gathering here today to kind of learn about what might be helpful for public comment. And again, here's that QR code and we'll also put a link in the chat to the federal register posting. So a little bit into the content of what the proposed sale notice is outlining, BOEM proposes to use a multiple factor auction format for this lease sale. This means that the lease sale will be a combination of monetary and non-monetary factors. So the bid is gonna be the sum of the monetary factor, which is the cash bid, and non-monetary factors, which are gonna be in the form of bidding credits, which I'll get a little bit more into in the next slide. Um, so a bidding credit is a non-monetary factor that contributes to the total bid. So BOEM is proposing to grant the following bidding credits to bidders who commit to any or all of the following. One is supporting workforce training programs or supply chain development for the floating offshore wind industry. Two, establishing a leasing area, a lease area use community benefit agreement with one or more communities, stakeholder groups, or tribal entities 
whose use of the lease area space or use of resources harvested from that space is expected to be impacted by potential offshore wind development. And then the third one would be establishing a general community benefit agreement with one or more communities, tribes, or stakeholder groups that are expected to be affected by the potential impacts on the marine, coastal, or human environment, such as impacts on visual or cultural resources resulting from lease development that are not otherwise addressed in the lease area use community benefit agreement. So these percentages here reflect what is currently listed in the proposed sale notice. So for example, the proposed bidding credit for the lease area use CBA will allow a bidder to receive a credit of 5% in exchange for a commitment to contribute to an existing lease area use community benefit agreement or a, commu a commitment to enter a new lease area use com community benefit agreement. So this is where that monetary versus non-monetary factor in the total sum of the bid comes in. And this is a lot of information I know, and this is a topic that we can revisit in our discussion today. I just kind of wanted to provide some context and show you guys a little bit about what is actually in the proposed sale notice. So I am gonna stop sharing my screen and I would like to introduce our first presenter, Matilda Kreider, who is joining us from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And I'll just give a reminder of what Karina said before that each of these presentations is gonna be about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll have just a couple of minutes after each presentation for clarifying questions but we're really encouraging you all to save your more juicy questions for the discussion later. So please kind of keep note of questions that come up along the way that you think would be a good um, discussion contribution. So with that, Matilda, take it away. All right, is slide sharing going well? I see it, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so yeah, my name is Matilda Kreider. I am a wind energy social science researcher at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and I will explain what that is. If you're not familiar, NREL is one of the U.S. Department of Energy's 17 national laboratories. Um, it's the only one that's focused entirely on renewable energy, um, doing everything from wind and solar generation to electric vehicles to building decarbonization. Um, and we have four campuses, but the majority of us are in Colorado, which is where I live. Um, and I did want to highlight that NREL has a lot of partnerships with local governments, tribes, utilities, um, businesses, doing technical assistance, um, workforce development, capacity building, all kinds of things on the community side. Um, we tend to be known a bit more for the technical research, but there's also a lot of work going on that's more on the, the side of working with um, communities on their plans for the energy transition. So defining community benefits um, is a very difficult thing to do. Everybody tends to have their own understanding and definition in their head of what it means and what its purpose is, what it should accomplish. Um, I don't think we necessarily all need to have the same definition, but just so you know how I'm defining it um, for what I'm talking about today. At NREL, we define it as an agreement fund or other mechanism that's voluntarily used by a developer to provide additional financial or non-financial benefits to a community. And we have three pillars here that um, we consider to be important. The first is that it should be shared. So the intention should be to share benefits with as much as the impact of the impacted group as possible. Um, it should also be local. So um, you'll see some benefits that are enacted on the state or regional level. So this isn't you know, definitive, but we do tend to consider community benefits to be local to the impacted area. Um, and then additional. So on top of property taxes or sales taxes or lease revenues or any other kind of benefits that are just you know, come as part of the development itself. Community benefits can come in a lot of different forms. Um, the form that you probably see talked about the most is the Community Benefit Agreement or CBA. And this is usually um, a legally binding formal agreement between a developer and then it can be a local government, tribal government, community organizations, lots of different groups can be parties uh, or governments can be parties to that agreement. But you'll also see community benefit funds established and um, that those are kind of enacted a little bit differently. So I'll talk about that a bit more as well. 
You'll also see direct investment in local priorities or programs. So this is often taking the form of donations to um, organizations or causes in the community. And then non-financial benefits, which can kind of encompass everything from expanded internet access to um, environmental protection to, you know, setting up educational and workforce development programs. So it can really come in a lot of different forms, depending on um, what the, the needs and priorities in the community are. And so just to highlight some of the ways that we have seen community benefits vary um, with financial benefits, the amount of financial investment is kind of the big one that makes the news in terms of how it varies, because you'll see, you know, $5 million, $100 million, those kinds of things tend to make the headlines. So that's one way that they vary. But you'll also see the um, method of distributing funds vary as well. So um, like I said, if it's a fund or it's a legal agreement or it's a direct donation, um, there's, there's different methods that you can use to distribute those funds. With non-financial benefits, the main way you'll see it vary is just the purpose or target. So whether it's education or environmental or whatever the, the purpose of that was, that's how you'll see those vary. But both of them will vary in terms of who makes decisions about benefits. So um, whether it's the local government or a committee of citizens or community organizations, um, the developer might be making the decisions. So those will vary um, the timeline. So whether it's you know when the lease auction occurs, when the project starts operations over the lifetime of the projects, we've seen variations in that as well. And then who or what receives the benefits. So um, whether it's going to the local government or going to a local um, organization or directly distributed to citizens or to a group like fishermen. Um, so that is another, another way that you'll see variation. I did just want to um, quick touch on the difference between a CBA and a community benefits plan because those names are very similar and get mixed up a lot um, for good reason because they are they are have some similarities. But a community benefits plan is a specific, actionable, measurable plan that's required for certain Department of Energy funding opportunities. These are under the Inflation Reduction Act or IRA or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or Bill. Um, this was a required a requirement that was established within the last year. And a CBA may be part of a community benefit plan, but it may also happen on its own. And so that is why you'll, you'll see some, some confusion between those two. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that further in the questions as well. So for offshore wind specifically, um, we are seeing CBAs grow in popularity and significance compared to land-based renewables or other energy sectors like oil and gas. Um, community benefits are playing a much more significant role in offshore wind. One of the reasons that I think this may be is that offshore wind has a different financial footprint in communities um, because it's taking place offshore. You're not seeing things like property taxes for the most part. You're not having landowner payments the way that you would with onshore wind where a turbine is on someone's property and they get paid for that. Um, and then also it's federal level siting, as you all know. So there's the opportunity for federal influence on the, on the practices, um, for example, encouraging or requiring CBAs. And it's also a new industry in a new era. So we're kind of transitioning from this, this framework of thinking of this as social acceptance, where you were trying to get people to be okay with the development and instead transitioning towards energy justice, wanting to share the benefits with as many people as possible and especially the most impacted people. Now to get into the examples. Um, so for offshore wind projects themselves, we have seen six um, community benefit agreements that are listed over here on the left and I did include two that are um, for leases that were not awarded. These were Castle Wind um, with Morro Bay, California and with fishermen's organizations in that area. Um, I think it's interesting to talk about those even though the leases weren't awarded just to see what was included in them. Um, and it kind of shows that that's sometimes the projects not ending up happening can be part of all of this. Um, but these have included provisions like a community benefit fund in several of them, um, grid infrastructure upgrades and grid resilience, ratepayer relief for low-income residents, expansion of internet access, local workforce development, and then um, the last two that didn't end up getting awarded had some investments in the fishing industry and commitments to collaborative project planning. And while tribes are not communities, I do want to highlight that there have been two tribal benefit agreements with tribes and offshore wind developers, the first being Flaventus um, Energy with the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians, and the second being Vineyard Wind with the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe in Massachusetts. Um, and these have included tribal benefit funds, um, shared environmental management responsibilities, establishment of an environmental research institute, workforce development, and collaborative project planning, including in the first case, um, the tribe being given the right to name the project however they choose. So it's currently called CADMO. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it currently, but it will have a new name. 
I want to talk about offshore wind cable landing separately because we're seeing these agreements look really different than the projects themselves. So cable landing site for anyone unfamiliar is where the cable transmit the offshore wind transmission cables come onshore on the land. Often the local government in that area has the ability to allow that siting to happen or disallow that siting from happening. And so um, we're seeing CBAs be formed between the developers and those governments. Um, and these have had a lot of money in them, to be frank, 16 million to 170 million. One CBA that the community turned down was like 260 million. So um, significant financial investment, and it's mostly in the form of direct payments to the local government. That has been the structure for them. And then lastly, offshore wind ports. So we've seen three agreements for offshore wind port development. Um, and these have had things like host community payments, local workforce training and business development, climate adaptation funds, um, offshore wind education, and zero emissions technology or low emissions technology at the port, which is an important one because port communities tend to be environmental justice communities disproportionately impacted by pollution from the activities happening at the port. So um, two of the, the agreements had provisions to help ensure that that will not be as damaging with this new industry. And then one thing I wanted to highlight um, it, with Vineyard Wind as an example is that it's not necessarily going to be that developers will only form one CBA with one community. So it's not like a zero sum game. There's opportunity for a variety of benefit to come from this. So you'll see um, community benefit agreement with Vineyard Power in 2015. And that was a community organization on Martha's Vineyard. You'll also see a host community agreement with Barnstable, Massachusetts um, for the cable landing from that project. You'll see a good neighbor agreement with Nantucket, Massachusetts, another island community that was impacted by the project infrastructure and then a tribal benefit agreement that I already mentioned. So it shows that developers can form relationships and provide benefits to communities that are impacted in different ways by the project rather than just one. So to talk a little bit about processes um, from the communities that we have engaged in this work, um, there is significant variation in how people are thinking about community benefits. Like I said, people have their, like everybody has their own definition and understanding. They also have a variety of motivations um, within, you know, the negotiation for benefits. So you might think of it as mitigating negative impacts from the project, but some people might think of it as sharing project revenues. Um, so there's, there's different ways of thinking about it. And we know that decision-making processes are important, but communities may have uncertainty about the process and what their role in, in it, all of this is. Um, there's no standardized process. There's no like one way of initiating negotiations or um, right now there's no requirement that CBAs have to be done for offshore wind or any kind of renewable energy development. So it, it can be hard for communities and developers and everyone else to kind of find their footing and their role in it. And uh, lastly, trust is a significant factor, um, whether that's you know distrust of the developer's intentions with offering benefits, um, distrust of your local government. Maybe you don't want funds going to your local government because you don't think they'll do important things or good things with them. Um, or if it's the, you know, that you really trust community organizations in your community and you trust them to represent you in negotiations. So all of that um, is influential. Just to comment a little bit on processes, even though I just obviously said that they vary a lot. Um, Factors like the community's context, so its history, the social and dynamics within the community, its access to financial resources, all of that can impact how the community um, benefits process goes. The type of project or infrastructure, so I pointed out how ports differ from cable landings, which differ from the project itself. Um, and then the developer. So I'm sure all of you probably have thoughts about that as well, that some developers um, are better to work with than others, and so that can be an influ influential factor. But I will say for offshore wind, we've seen really extensive discussions between um, community organizations and governments and representatives with developers. Um, we've seen coordination and collaboration between multiple groups within the community. Um, so rather than you know, one group being the one that does the negotiation, we're seeing collaborations going on. And then we're also seeing facilitation and technical expertise like lawyers and technical consultants being brought in to um, help support communities in this process. I'll point out that that's very different than land-based wind energy and land-based um, solar, where the process is really has been led by the developers and the community has not has had as much input into, into the decisions. So offshore wind, we're seeing communities have more power in CBA negotiations than in other industries. Now to talk about how this all is shaping and impacting offshore wind deployment and development. So um, it's actually uncertain how community benefits relate to project outcomes. Um, a lot of research on this has been done in Europe where the practice of using community benefits has been much more standardized and common over there for offshore and land-based wind development. 
Um, it's definitely possible that community benefits can be perceived by communities as a bribe from developers to buy their support. And some of the things that can influence how communities perceive community benefits include the structure and contents of the agreements, um, who was involved in the decision making, so what members of the community, if it's only the local government being involved and you don't trust your local government, then maybe you um, are going to perceive it more negatively, who receives the benefits, and then the timing. So um, one example is if the developer is coming into the table at the last minute after opposition has already been voiced and offering benefits at that point, it may look more like they're trying to buy the support of the community. Um, I have a couple examples to highlight on the side here, um, but the, the one at the bottom I'll point out, the, govern the um, leader mayor of Ocean City, Maryland saying Ocean City cannot be bought after um, the community was offered financial compensation for hosting a cable landing from the US wind projects. In terms of how community benefits relate to equity, this is a really big and important question that um, governments at all levels are trying to figure out because a lot of people are seeing community benefits as a pathway to help ensure that offshore wind development is more equitable. Um, and so there definitely has the potential to create equitable outcomes. You're sharing benefits with and across an impacted community. So you're helping ensure that, you know, the benefits from these huge infrastructure developments are going to those communities. Um, if you have an equitable decision-making process that has, you know, diverse representation of community interests at the table, then you can help ensure that um, the outputs are more equitable. You can also structure the benefits so that they are directly flowing to disadvantaged community members. And that's what we see, have seen um, for example, with the port communities, ensuring that workforce development and hiring and um, pollution prevention, all these things that are important to the disadvantaged port communities are being done. But I would also point out that there's some potential to create or reinforce inequities with community benefits um, if there's inequitable distribution of benefits between and within communities. So when I say between communities, if wealthier or more resourced communities are getting more benefits, than others um, or within communities if some community groups or you know, groups of people within the population stand to benefit more from, than others. Um, likewise, if the decision-making processes were inequitable, if there wasn't diverse representation of people at the table um, and people didn't feel represented by the people that were doing the negotiations. Um, and you'll also see that some communities have more ability to advocate for themselves because of the resources they have. So, you know, if they have wealth and access to lawyers and other technical expertise that help them be more powerful in the negotiations, they may end up getting more um, money, frankly, from developers than others. So we're starting to see some communities that were already, you know, doing very well financially and didn't have a lot of socioeconomic disadvantage being the ones to get a lot of money from developers. Um, where you would argue that in terms of equity, it should be going to communities that have more challenges in those areas. And the last thing I'll talk about is whether benefits should be standardized or required, which is kind of a big topic within the industry right now. Um, obviously, the bidding credits are one way to kind of start to incentivize or encourage the use, but it's still not a hard requirement. Um, and then the standardization is definitely not there either. So some people would argue that the, you know, the pros of this are that you could help increase the equity between communities if there was a standardized benefits package that has to be offered to everyone. It also ensures communities would get benefits. So rather than having to negotiate and push for it, um, it ensures that everybody would get something. It would set clearer expectations for the developers and the communities. Everybody would know kind of what they're getting into and, and what they should expect, both in terms of like financials and the project financials um, and in terms of their relationship to each other. And this would lessen the capacity burning burden on communities. Um, it would mean that they don't have to do as much work to you know, push for these benefits and collaborate with each other and, and decide what should be done. It would, it would lessen that burden. But um, some of the cons or challenges with standardizing and requiring benefits would mean it's less, less flexible and customizable to the community. So if everybody's offered the same thing, there's no saying that there's no, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that what you're offered would be in line with what the community needs. Um, it would be hard to set a standard for who receives the benefit. So you'd have to maybe draw a lot like a circle around the project and say everybody within this is going to benefit or something like that, which I think would be challenging. Um, if it's not voluntarily voluntary, it may not be perceived as positively. So I think everybody kind of gets that like if you're just getting money because it's required, like, you know, property taxes or something, as opposed to feeling like somebody, you know, purposefully offered benefits um, because they they wanted to share that with you, then I think that shapes people's perceptions. 
There's also an added cost for the developer. Um, and then the question of who would create the requirement. So who would be given the power to um, set that requirement, I think could end up being controversial and difficult. A couple of options to highlight, um, you can require but not standardize. So you could say that um, benefits have to be given in some way, um, but leave it up to the community to determine what that should be. Um, you could set requirements at the state level, but not at the federal level. Um, you could also provide incentives. So the, you know, similar to the bidding credit that BOEM is offering to incentivize um, CBAs, but not require it. And then lastly, you could standardize, but not require. So um, an example I like to highlight from Europe is that in the UK, there are standardized benefit schemes that developers use, but they're actually not required. Um, it was just that the industry just decided and set standards and they were supported by the government in doing so. And, and a lot of them adhere to those standards, but it's actually not a legal requirement anywhere. And so I'll just wrap up by um, going some key takeaways from all this, but I'll also be around for questions, obviously. Um, the first is that there's currently no standard or typical definition, form, or process for community benefits in the United States. I think some people um, coming into this might expect that there would be. You would think like that, that this is a set process um, that they just need to engage in, but it's being done kind of in an ad hoc way, which is challenging for everyone. Um, you have to kind of get caught up to speed to engage in it. Um, and that is just a barrier um, to having things be done efficiently and, and equitably. There's also complicated relationships with key outcomes in wind energy deployment. So we don't necessarily know that this makes projects more successful or makes communities more supportive of projects or makes projects more equitable. Um, so all of those things are challenges as well. And, and that's something that researchers in this field are, are trying to figure out more concretely for the US as the industry develops. But lastly, we know that these community benefits are of growing importance to everyone involved in offshore wind. And so despite those uncertainties, we're going to keep you know, working to better understand them and learn from the communities that have undergone the process so that we have some, some more certainty going forward. And I think that is, oh, um, I thought that was my last slide, but it was not. Um, I'll just point out what NREL's ongoing work in this is, um, conducting multiple years of research. Um, we've collected data across all land-based and offshore wind projects in the US. Obviously, that is a lot easier for offshore wind than land-based wind because, you know, there's not a ton of offshore wind projects, but we've looked at over a thousand land-based wind projects. Um, and this is to identify relationships with social acceptance, project outcomes, and perceptions of equity. Um, we'll publish that database of community benefit examples sometime this summer on DOE's Wind Exchange website. We also have a wind energy community benefits guide um, already published on that website that you can find basically if you search those exact words or just search wind energy community benefits guide, you'll find it. And then we have a wind energy equity community of practice that is trying to unite everybody that's working on this for offshore wind in one place to um, you know, talk best practices and try to iron out some definitions and things like that. So that is all highlight for you. Awesome. Thank you, Matilda. That was very helpful. So we have a couple minutes for if anyone has a clarifying question. I see one in the chat. Maureen says, what websites will data what website will the database of community benefit examples appear on? I believe. Yes. That will be on the wind exchange website, which is a Department of Energy website, and I can put the link to that. Um, we will send out also a um, document with the resources that have been presented here or other ones that our speakers give us um, in the follow-up from the meeting. So don't panic if you don't get it right now. Cool. Um, I see that there was some questions about the tribal benefits, so I can go back to that slide, but if it will be too much to reshare, I can just say the numbers. Um, the CBA with Vineyard Power was a $15 million fund. The um, host community agreement with Barnstable, Massachusetts was 16 million. Um, the good neighbor agreement with Nantucket, Massachusetts was 4 million. And I actually will double check this while Catherine is presenting, but I don't know that they published the numbers for the Mashpee Wampanoag one. I think they might have kept that private. So um, I'm not actually sure what the financial commitment for that was. So sorry about that. Yeah, and there was another question that said, um, are the tribal benefit agreements that you mentioned publicly available? Yeah, so that is a challenging part of doing research on this generally, or just trying to be an engaged citizen in it, is that they're often kept private. Um, so a lot of these agreements that I mentioned, you can physically see, but a lot of them you also cannot. 
um, which is just a challenge and an issue, I think, in the industry. Um, I'm not totally sure why developers or communities choose to keep them private, but often they are. And so in the case of um, the tribal benefit agreements, I haven't seen a legal like document to read for either of those. So I think unless anyone has anything else, that is definitely a topic that we could come back to in the discussion. Um, so with that, thank you so much, Matilda. Um, oh yeah, I see another question came in. Let's, if we can bring that question to the discussion later and we'll make sure we get back to it. Um, so Catherine, I'd like to introduce Catherine Hoff, who is joining us today from UC Berkeley um, Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment. And I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, can you see my slide? Got it. Awesome, thanks. Um, so I'm Catherine Hoff. I'm a research fellow at the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment, or CLE, as we call it for short. Um, the Climate Project at CLE is a uh, climate research think tank that's focused on implementation of carbon-free solutions and a just, equitable transition. Um, CLE started working on offshore wind in about 2019. Um, we have convened um, working groups and webinars. We provide educational materials and conduct solutions-oriented research. Um, and in the last year, we've particularly focused on um, community benefits agreements and community benefits in the offshore wind space. So um, Matilda went over this, but I just want to sort of remind people um, there's a huge umbrella of community benefits. Um, some of them are listed here. Matilda referred to others like host community agreements. Um, some of the ones that um, have become more prominent in the conversation recently are community benefits plans, which as Matilda said, are features of Department of Energy grants. Then we have community benefits agreements, which we'll talk more about, and then project labor agreements, um, which are construction project related. Um, so that's just a few examples. Um, there are a lot of different mechanisms to develop or to deliver um, community benefits. And I think a key question um, from the community perspective is, does the community have a voice in any of these mechanisms? Are community and labor groups represented in these conversations? Um, but let's sort of back up for a minute. And if we're focusing on CBAs, community benefits agreements, um, let's back up and think about um, what is sort of a classic CBA apart from the offshore wind context. Um, so classic CBAs developed um, in the sort of real estate and product development space. Um, these are projects that come before a city council um, or other local authority. Um, and developers require permits and project approval from these local bodies. Um, historically, they were signed with community and labor groups um, and the community um, and labor groups received benefits in exchange for agreeing not to oppose a project or to support it. Um, so this made it easier for the developer when they went before city council or the local agency to get approval for their project, if they could say that the community groups were on board, um, it made it a lot easier for them to get project approval. This is um, just a visualization of what I just talked about. Um, it's from a really good resource um, that is called Community Benefits Agreements, Making Development, Pro Making Development Projects Accountable. Um, Julian Gross is a California lawyer who's done a lot of work in the space, um, and this just kind of shows you um, how on a traditional um, real estate development project, um, a CBA can um, involve community and bring their voices to the table. Um, so if we think about CBAs in general, I think it's helpful to think about CBA provisions in two buckets. Um, the first is uh, process related provisions. And then the second bucket is material benefits for communities. So um, CBA process related provisions can include things like ongoing monitoring of the project, periodic reporting, community governance structures, and conflict resolutions measures like mediation. 
material benefits can include um, anything that the community dreams up and the developer will agree to. Um, those measures can include infrastructure, child care facilities, um, affordable housing, lots of other things. Um, Matilda has mentioned some of them. Um, it There is no sort of um, beyond what the lawyers will say about what's possible to include in a contract and um, what the developer will agree to, there's really no um, requirement for what these um, different provisions can entail or include. Um, so that's kind of a big picture on community benefits agreements specifically. Um, let's look at a few examples to put that in context. So the Staples Center LA Live CBA is one that a lot of people point to. Um, it was um, signed in 2001 and was negotiated around the development of a hotel and entertainment complex adjacent to the Staples Center Arena in Los Angeles. The um, financiers and developers included Rupert Murdoch and the Anschutz Entertainment Group. Um, the community coalition consisted of a lot of different groups from environmental to labor to community. Um, two of the lead organizations were Strategic Action for a Just Economy and the LA Alliance for a New Economy, but there were many groups that were involved. Um, the negotiations lasted nine months and produced a CBA and a cooperation agreement. Um, together, those documents set out the various uh, benefits that the community won. And those um, included provisions, as you can see on the slide, like um, local higher living wages and job training, um, open space provisions, um, et cetera. In addition, um, the CBA included um, some process provisions. There are regular um, meetings and regular report outs from the developer um, on <clears throat> um, their targets for um, hiring and jobs, et cetera. A uh, second example I wanted to talk about is the New Flyer CBA. This one was signed pretty recently in 2022. Um, New Flyer of America is a electric bus manufacturer. Um, the community groups involved were Grady, Greater Birmingham Ministries and Jobs to Move America. Um, and the CBA applies to New Flyer's facilities in two locations. Um, one is in Ontario, California, and one is in Anniston, Alabama. Uh, many of the CBA provisions uh, focus around jobs and workplace issues. Um, so um, hiring, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, training, et cetera. Um, we've been told that environmental measures were originally included in the asks from the community groups, um, but in the process of negotiation, the community groups decided to let the environmental measures go in exchange for winning other, other measures that you see included here um, that were part of the final agreement. Um, what's interesting about this CBA is that in Anniston, there were significant populations of formerly incarcerated folks and veterans. And so the community really fought for provisions that spoke, spoke specifically to those groups of people um, and would help them get employment. So for example, uh, New Flyer is not allowed to ask about um, criminal history before an offer of, an, of employment is made. Um, in looking at best practices for effective CBAs, um, we um, have found that experts recommend four principles um, those are listed on the slide and include, number one, a representative coalition, an inclusive, transparent, and accessible process, CBA provisions that are responsive to community needs and provide specific, concrete, and meaningful benefits, and enforcement and monitoring mechanisms. On the flip side of that, you can see um, that some signs of a weak CBA are um, minimal community representation, minimal participation by the community. The negotiations are secretive. The CBA provisions are ambiguous um, and or there are no enforcement mechanisms included in the CBA or they are very weak. So let's talk about what a lot of people consider a bad CBA, um, Atlantic Yards. So the Atlantic Yards project um, has since been renamed Pacific Park. Um, it is in Brooklyn, New York. Um, it was a, the construction, the project was around a basketball arena um, and it also included office and retail space. 
Uh, the developer was given over 200 million in public subsidies. And the CBA contained a number of provisions, um, including jobs, affordable housing, workforce development, um, community facilities, et cetera. So what are the problems with the Atlantic Yard CBA? Um, well, first of all, the community signatories didn't really represent the community. There was also little to no oversight over CBA implementation. Um, for example, the CBA required the developer to hire an independent monitor, but the developer never did. And the community groups that signed the CBA and could have enforced that provision either uh, went defunct or uh, decided for some reason not to uh, try to enforce that provision. So there was never um, an independent monitor hired. The CBA also had uh, ambiguous provisions, um, not very detailed at all, and very little follow-up um, required in the CBA. And then um, there were also significant co conflicts of interest. So for example, the developer paid the main community group from the coalition to give out a newspaper that was funded by the developer um, to people in the community. So clear conflict of interest, um, developer appears to have bought out the community in that particular case. Um, so we looked at what are CBAs, we looked at them in the classic context, we've um, ha looked at an overview of um, provisions that can be in them, and we've looked at some examples as well as um, principles for good CBAs. Let's turn back to the offshore wind context. Um, this is just a snapshot of uh, what's been happening in California. Um, and one thing that I wanted to point out is that between the uh, proposed sale notice and the final sale notice, BOEM actually made quite a few changes um, to the language. And so they, for example, in response to public comments, they added a general CBA um, at 5%. And they increased the percentage of um, the lease area use CBA. It was originally 2.5%. It was increased to 5 point per, sorry, 5% um, for the final sale notice. Um, and so it's important to read the PSN um, and add your comment. Um, these are some of the things that are in the California executed leases. Um, we, as Oregon has, we have two different kinds of CBAs. Um, and at least in California, according to the executed leases, the um, final CBAs signed with the communities and submitted by the developers are due um, after the construction and operations plan. So on this BOEM timeline, that stage is after the orange bar, um, after BOEM approves the COP and in the beginning of kind of that red stage. This um, is a graphic that we created just to try and map an ideal CBA process onto uh, this BOEM timeline that I just showed you. Um, so you can see that the CBAs are not actually gonna be finalized for quite a while, um, probably six to eight years in California. Um, and I know that that is very small. So here is a look at the top half of that. Um, and then here is a look at the bottom half. Um, so uh, that gives you an idea of what we're thinking about in California. Um, and I think um, the, you know, what I just wanted to end on is um, thinking about what community benefits you would like to see. Um, and then what will the developer agree to? What can you negotiate for and when? Um, and these are just some of the references and resources um, that we've relied on. And um, these, of course, as Sarah mentioned, uh, will go out after the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. That was super helpful. So again, we have just a couple minutes for some clarifying questions. I see one. Um, what's the difference between the lease area use CBA and the general CBA? Um, I don't know if you want to, I, I can grab that or you can, Catherine. Um, so in California and Oregon, as you saw, there are, there are the two CBA bidding credits. So the lease area use is specifically focused on 
the geographic space within those lease areas and communities um, or tribes that will be affected by that direct overlap of geographic space. And then the general CBA and also, sorry, CBA is community benefit agreement. I know we've been saying that a lot. Um, and the general community benefit agreement can be applied to any communities, tribes, or other stakeholders who are impacted by other effects that are outside of that geographic space, like view shed um, impacts, for example, or environmental impacts. I hope that helped to clarify. Um, and then I see one other question came in. Can you confirm that developers can engage in the creation of a CBA even if they do not begin that process through a CBA bid credit offered? That's a great question. So I think the maybe the MASHP um, CBA is an example of that. So the um, Vineyard Offshore, the developer, had already signed, a, had already committed to and negotiated a CBA um, uh, when the project started, when Vineyard One started back in 2015. Um, and then they basically, they just did a voluntary community benefits agreement with one particular tribe. Um, and so um, as Matilda said, there are very few details available. Um, you can read the press release and you will know basically everything I know about that CBA. Um, but um, the developer clearly decided that it was in its interest to negotiate a CBA uh, voluntarily with that particular tribe. Yeah, and I think uh, Matilda also mentioned this, that the bidding credits are not the only mechanism that could result in a CBA. They are just meant to incentivize bidders and developers to um, establish CBAs. But even if the bidding credits in the Oregon lease were not um, used, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be any sort of CBA in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add like all of the examples that I highlighted, all of those were in the absence of a CBA um, bidding credit because the Northeast, all the lease auctions that have happened in the Northeast didn't have that credit. Um, the California ones where the projects project wasn't um, chosen, I guess is like maybe one example of how it was an expectation that there would have be, been that um, bidding credit because they did that groundwork before, but the rest were all without that that incentive. So I see a question in the chat about, is there an opportunity in the um, um, proposed sale notice, the bone proposed sale notice process to comment require CBA? So in the proposed sale notice, they actually have provisions for um, CBAs. You can comment on them now through July 1, and you could suggest changes to them, for example. So the answer is basically yes to that question. And again, that is all of these questions we can expand more on in our discussion time. These are all really wonderful questions. Um, just for the sake of time, it's two o'clock. We have a quick um, little announcement from Hilary Boudet, who is here. Um, she is from Oregon State University and the Pacific Marine Energy Center, which is out of OSU. Um, and she has a quick little update for us before we move into our discussion. Hi, yes, thanks to Karina and Sarah for letting me say a few words. I'm Hilary Boudet. I'm a professor of sociology and public policy at Oregon State. We actually have an active ongoing research project on uh, this topic of community benefits from offshore wind development well, we have uh, research ongoing in, um, with partners at University of Delaware, University of Maine, Cal Poly Humboldt, University of Washington, um, Renewable Northwest, the Affiliative Tribes of Northwest Indians, and the Sea Grants. So that's why they've led us here. Um, of interest, particular interest to this crowd, we are doing case studies of community benefits arrangements from offshore energy development including both document analysis and interviews with the community members and others and developers that have negotiated them. So we'll be um, completing those this summer and hopefully come back to you in the fall with a presentation on what we've learned from that process. And then we're going to select six communities that are impacted, potentially impacted by floating offshore wind in Oregon, Maine, California, and Washington, and be doing 
um, interviews and surveys in those communities as well. And so um, in Coos Bay and Brookings, we'll be out probably in the fall for interviews and in next summer for surveys. So if you see us out and students out, please, um, or if you want to participate, please reach out. We, we, we welcome your comments and feedback on our project. And this is all funded by the Department of Energy. So thank you. Right. Thank you, Hillary. And we do have a little slide that Hillary put together that we can share too, if you want to kind of see a recap of what that was. Yes, yeah, she could have shown it. If she, uh, yeah. yeah well, we'll share I, it I just wanted to be quick. You wanted me yeah, to be thank quick. You. Okay. We'll, we'll send it out with the slide deck. So you'll get it. Well, thank you, Hillary. All right. So it is 2.02. We're doing pretty good on time. So now we are going to move into our discussion portion. Thank you to all of our presenters. That was really awesome. And I know that that was a lot of information. Um, so again, these slides and this recording will be available after this if you want to revisit anything. And we can kind of dig into these topics more in this presentation. So I am just going to share what I put up before really quickly just to go over this meeting contract. Um, the main point of this is we really want to have an engaging discussion and conversation, but we just want to make sure that we're respectful of each other and then also respectful of time and to be mindful of your speaking time too. So we have kind of three parts to this question tech format. Um, we encourage you if to uh, say your question out loud, then you use the raise hand function. I see we already have one raise hand and we'll get to you right after that. Um, if you wanna put in an anonymous question, please use the question and answer function. And then, so here's that again. And then if you want to kind of add on to the current question or topic, write in a quick chat and say either a cue or anything to indicate that you'd like to add on. But the primary things that we're gonna use to have a cue of um, either questions or contributions are the raise hand, and then if you want it to be anonymous, the Q&A. Um, and I know this is a lot, and the reason why we're doing this is because we wanted to be in a regular Zoom format and not a webinar format so we can see all of each other um, and all be on the same screen. And with that too, you know, if you're comfortable to put your video on and definitely get into it and um, get engaged and what we can hopefully have a good discussion about all of this stuff. So I am gonna kind of moderate and facilitate this and Karina is gonna keep track of the queue of when questions come in and just try to keep your question to one, one question or topic at a time and you know one to two minute max just so we can make sure we get everyone um, included. All right, and we have, we have a couple additional slides um, that we could share, but just for now, we'll we'll keep um, keep it open like this. Should we start with Rick? Yeah, hands up. Hey everybody, uh, I'm going to keep my camera off. I have some low bandwidth uh, where I'm at right now, so <clears throat> you know I will put down my hand though. Um, <laughs> So I represent a tribe in Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lorem, Quan, Sayusla Indians. And, and, and as you mentioned in the summary of the uh, bid document, the draft document, it essentially says, uh, refers, you know, that these CBAs can be entered between, you know, local government, comma, tribes, comma, or other folks. So I forget the exact language. I don't have it in front of me. Is there any examples of a requirement in these documents that, um, you know, CBAs be entered with tribes? I guess we're a little nervous that, um, you know, that these folks might just shop, you know, kind of the low bidder as far as who's willing to enter into a CBA while ignoring, you know, the interests of, you know, the tribes and others in the community. 
Yeah, that that is a great question. Um, I'm going to pass Matilda or Catherine, if either of you guys feel like you have an answer to that, I'll let you guys jump in. Um, I can pop in Matilda, I don't know. I can't see if I'm cutting in front of you, but um, I think uh, in California, the the developers are contemplating doing multiple CBAs um, and they very much want the support of all impacted groups, inclu including tribal nations. Um, and so I think they are very much planning on doing CBAs with different tribal nations in California. Um, we also at the state level have legislation that has set up a working group with the California Coastal Commission on fisheries issues um, related to offshore wind. And that working group is supposed to come up with a strategic plan. Um, and so a lot of the, um, the interested parties, including tribal nations, are in those conversations. And my expectation is that those conversations will lead to a lease area use CBA down the road. Um, I think a lot of tribes in California are also thinking about um, what, um, how to how to encourage um, developers to do um, CBAs in a meaningful way that includes tribal sovereignty. And that is a very interesting um, conversation that is not quite related to your question, um, but a lot of people are thinking about these issues. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Right. I, I Sorry, Karina. I, I was just going to comment or ask if anyone knows. I don't think there's anything preventing, first of all, public comment to say, we suggest maybe you have a CBA for tribes. Um, but I don't know the law there. I just know that in some of the funding that has come out recently, there have been set asides. Um, I don't know if that's what you were thinking, Rick, or and whether that's feasible uh, with BOEM. Well, that's certainly something we've considered commenting is that, you know, separate from CBAs that, um, you know, there be a specific, you know, call for tribal benefit agreement. Yeah. And we've heard from, folks, tribes on the East Coast, you know, that have been lumped into some of the larger community benefit agreements that, you know, tribes are receiving less, less benefits than like small towns and municipalities, you know, mm. as a, as a sovereign nation. Hmm. Yeah. So in the language um, that you were kind of referring to, it set, so for example, the general community benefit agreement, it says with one or more communities, tribes, or stakeholder groups that are expected to be affected. So yeah, there's no language that specifically says it has to be, um, it's just one or all kind of, there's no, um, nothing that's is like specifically like you must have a, um, tribal CBA as well as a community CBA. So I, I think that that, like what you said, that that is a great topic to comment on. Um, I, I would like to go back to a question that was in the chat earlier that's somewhat related. Um, uh, I think uh, there was the question of whether there would be an opportunity for a county, Curry County, to apply for grants to add capacity here locally to manage the impacts and represent our interests. It seems to me, and I would love feedback from others here who maybe know more, that that could be a request for a modification to the proposed sale notice and or to be specific about what C a CBA could, the general CBA could cover. I don't know if anybody can speak to that. Yeah, not not within the bidding credit structure, but I can speak a little bit just to like how technical assistance has been funded by CBAs in mm -hmm. offshore wind. So, so several of the um, ones on the East Coast, um, for example, Block Island or the one in um, Maine with Monhegan Island, and I think possibly the first Vineyard Wind one with Vineyard Power as well, all included 
um, the process included the developer financing um, like a lawyer or other some form of technical assistance for that capacity building side of things and the community representatives we've spoken to have said that that worked really well for them. Um, of course, the difficulty with that is that that would have to be like something the developer agrees to and it would have to be something you work out early on in the process, which would not be obviously as optimal as it being just required as, as part, of the, part of the bidding credit. Um, but I say that just to say that if that is something that would be helpful to your community, that you know, there's proof of concept that it can be done, even if it doesn't end up being required by them. So. Um, sorry, I have to jump in. The caveat with that um, is that under if 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 technical experts are part of the CDA agreements, those won't be happening until much later in the development process. There are conversations in California with developers right now about extra funding for engagement. And those conversations are completely separate from CBAs. Um, those are conversations where the developers are just contemplating pitching in money um, because they think it's beneficial to have folks um, engaged and um, have the capacity to participate in this process. So something like a technical expert um, and or a lawyer could be part of those early discussions, um, but you would not want to wait for the CBA stage to do that. Yeah, and just, I'll, I'll just say like looking at these doc, you know, looking at the documents that are available, they're very legalistic. So it would, it would be very beneficial to communities, I think, to have that kind of support. There are four questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, there's one in the chat and two folks with hands up. I'm going to, I have sort of an order here. Two came into the Q&A first, then I'm going to go to the folks with their hands up and then uh, to the other two. So just so you have a sense of when you'll show up. Um, next question is from, uh, it says, we are a resource capacity constrained community that will be impacted by offshore wind development. How can we get help in organizing ourselves and representing our interests in a way that ensures that everyone is represented? Um, all right. I guess that question du jour. Yeah, yeah that, <laughs> I, I wish I could completely answer that. Catherine, I see you're unmuted. Um, do you have any recommendations? Well, not to give you all a work, but it seems to me that these kinds of conversations are the first sort of starting point for that, right? So communities, first step is communities need to get together and decide what they want to ask for um, and what's possible. And, um, and then, you know, start thinking about coalition structures. Um, and um, I think that's that's kind of the the first steps. Find your friends, figure out what you want. Yeah, and I think that that kind of jumps off the the last question too. And what was the you guys were saying technical support? What was the term that you guys were using to talk about um, like possible grants for building capacity? It was technical assistance is what we call it. Okay, yeah. technical assistance. Yeah, so it sounds like that that this question also, you know, we all can recognize that a lot of communities don't have the capacity to start pulling all this together and afford lawyers and all, you know, it, it's time consuming and it can be expensive. So I would definitely keep that in mind if you're thinking of providing public comment. Um, so... I saw in the chat that, you know, reference to NREL and Sea Grant helping with that kind of technical assistance. Certainly, Sarah's getting on board right now. Sea Grant does have a law center, um, and Sarah and I are scoping out sort of what we can do with the resources we have. So we will be following up. Um, I think, you know, we're just trying to get ready for the public comment period, which is coming, you know, ending, which is coming at Fast and Furious. So we wanted to... Um, um, just make sure you had this this starting framework and we will yeah. you're listening. So uh, just just so you know. Yeah. Um, in next can I go to the next question? I think that's we're good. Yeah. In California, there is currently legislation being considered to place a direct tax on developers that would go towards a community capacity fund, which would facilitate community participation in, for example, CBA negotiations. 
Um, are you aware of any other states which have attempted to create this type of capacity support legislatively? Similarly, do you know of a non of any non-legislative methods being used to enhance community capacity to engage in CBA creation? So this is more of a legislative um, approach. I mean, that's like, I'll just say, I think, you know, once you decide what you want, uh, you can certainly, you know, one approach is to start talking to your local representatives. Um, I don't, you know, that's civics in action. I'm not sure how it's organized in Oregon. In California, yeah. there, um, the California Energy Commission is the sort of lead state agency for visioning and strategic planning on offshore wind. Um, and through that comment process and the strategic plan comments, um, a lot of community groups have made it clear that there is a dire need for capacity um, funding and engagement funding. And I think that has helped um, ramp up the conversation in the state. Um, so there may be multiple forums and um, Sometimes even if uh, something isn't directly applicable to the document that's technically up for public comment, um, public comments about relevant issues on the issue can, um, you can make yourself heard through those processes. Um, um, even if the agency won't necessarily be the one to implement any solutions. Um, so not clear that CEC would directly give out money for groups to engage in offshore wind in California, but certainly there's been a groundswell and a cry for that. And people have taken notice um, at the state level, philanthropy as well. Um, and so those conversations have started in addition to the legislative solution that um, was raised in the Q&A. Anything else on this topic? I would like to go to the patient people. I see we already lost one hand. I hope it's because we answered the question, not because they ran out of steam waiting. Um, Bill, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just a little kind of confused. Um, I've been hearing a lot in the uh, news that of lawsuits and a lot of different organizations that are against the offshore wind and I was just wondering, so they're still going to go ahead with the with the lease sale, even though from the state perspective and even from sounds like the senator, senators and the local fishing groups and that kind of stuff that are opposing it, they're still going to go ahead and do the lease sale. Is that correct? So I could kind of, I could try to kind of answer this. So yes, and it, we're we're just kind of following and what we presented before were Boehm's projections. They are still projecting to hold this lease sale in October of this year. And that as, as we know right now, that is the that's Boehm's plan. And you know, they're tasked with certain things and you know this is their next step for Oregon so I think the whole point of this uh, webinar um, is to just be aware of the process and what the next steps for BOEM are just so we can all be prepared and also just help communities start thinking about if this lease sale takes place and if down the line wind farms are developed to know that community benefit agreements are an option. And it's something that is outlined in the proposed sale notice. And it's something that people can be aware of um, going down the line. So as of now, Boehm's plan is to hold this lease auction in October. And that is what we know. Um, and I mean, that that's subject to change. And again, the, the lease does not necessarily mean that a wind project will end up being developed. There are like 
multiple steps after the lease that developers will have to take for a project to be approved. Um, so this is kind of just step one in BOEM's process of trying to develop offshore renewable energy. I hope that kind of helps answer the question. It is a very difficult and confusing thing to understand. Karina, I know, did you want to add in anything on that? No, I mean, you know, I can just share that at the OPAC meeting we had earlier today, um, there was a call for um, request to ask the governor to ask Bohm to pause until the roadmap is done at the state level. Um, you know, so if it's unclear whether that would go forward or not. There are other constraints around the timing of the lease sales and their link to um, federal um, uh, fossil fuel leasing uh, that's in federal legislation. So, uh, you know, that it might really delay it. If they, So there's some, there's a variety of things that are sort of setting the schedule or constraining the schedule in the, in the, in Bohm's actions. So um, it's not, it's not straightforward for any party, I think. Yeah. And I think the, the most important thing is that the public comment for the proposed sale notice is open until July 1st. And that's why, we you know, we want to have this conversation before then. So people have the opportunity to kind of get their thoughts around what an effective public comment for the proposed sale notice might look like. And I said before, there's not going to be any public comment on the final sale notice. So I think it's all about being prepared and really regardless of what your, you know, ideal future for offshore wind looks like, whether it's no offshore wind or, you know, development with considerations, this right now is a good way to, you know, get the proposed sale notice, get the final sale notice right and kind of prepare yourself for prepare communities for any outcome and to know that community benefit agreements are a potential outcome um and the you know the stronger and the more focused the terms of the final sale notice are and if there are specific things that people would like to see included um if it's in the final sale notice, then it's more, it would be more likely as an option down the line. So it's really just about being prepared for whatever happens. And this is a really great opportunity for input. Um, so for example, Kareen and I have been looking at the proposed sale notice um, and we noticed that under the workforce development and supply chain um, bidding credit section, it goes into a lot more depth about outlining what a commitment to supply chain um, development would look like and examples specifically of, you know, what monetary contributions can be um, in, I'm, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. And then, but the two community benefit bidding credit sections are a little bit more vague um, in what would a, what a community benefit agreement could encapsulate. So Catherine's slide um, when she said, you know, her last slide, start thinking about what are benefits that you would like to see um, and then what benefits, you know, what agreements, what Sorry, what benefits do you think you could, um, I forget the the language you used, Catherine, but what could you negotiate for, I think was, that's what it said. Um, those are possibly things that you could be commented and put into the final sale notice um, because it would be, it, it's more likely that that outcome would happen if the language is in the final sale notice. I, yeah, that, I, I, may have, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. You. yeah, of course. The the only the only thing right now, as I understand it, that the developers have to present to um 
get those bidding credits, uh, one of the big things they have to do is a conceptual strategy. Um, so they will be doing that as they bid or to meet the terms of the um, of the bidding. They have to develop a conceptual strategy. Um, you know, they're going to be concerned with satisfying the agreements in Bohm's eyes, right? Because if they don't satisfy them to the satisfaction of Bohm and the parties who are signatories to those agreements, then they'll have to pay cash to, what is it, the Office of Natural Resource Revenue, sort of federal um, entity that, you know, they, they, you know, they don't satisfy those terms, they have to pay in cash. The benefit to the developers in the short term, at least, is they don't have to, they can claim the bidding credit um, but not pay for it immediately, right? To close the deal on the lease agreement. So it's deferring their investments um, in the community and the community benefit agreements. And there's a timeline uh, has to be before the 10 year anniversary of the lease and, or what's the other provision, Sarah, or if, uh, the- oh, uh, The facility design report. Which... Yeah, the first submission right. of the facility right. design report, which is a part of the later part of the process. So. You know, I had a question about that. Why does the money go back to the feds if they don't deliver? Could it come back to the communities for all the pain and suffering? <laughs> yeah. Jamie Gannon has written, I think, at least one op-ed on that. Um, and <laughs> has also coordinated with the Brookings Institute to yeah. make a plea for revenue sharing. Um, unfortunately, I don't think BOEM is has the power to change that in this particular round of okay. auctions, but it's certainly something that should be looked at for the future. Hmm. There are a couple of questions in the chat that we haven't quite gotten to yet. Um, and uh, one was, I, I think uh, our presenters tried to speak to this, but um, Peggy asks, what have the outcomes shown in previous community benefit agreements? And she had a second question, which is separate, but um, uh, little, maybe a little more philosophical. How can a price be put on damage to the ecosystem? Anyone want to? I, I might refer people to the slides and the recording um, on the yeah. first one, unless someone wants to add to it. One of our In terms of um, outcome, maybe I need to clarify what you mean by that. But if you yeah. mean the outcomes in terms of... Um, like long-term how it impacted the communities. I would say there's two reasons we don't totally know those yet. One is that um, a lot of these are rather new. So like with the, with the exception of a couple that were um, from early offshore wind development um, coming close to 10 years now, most of them are within the last couple of... Oops. We lost. I think we lost, we lost her audio for a little bit. I bet it'll come back. Um, she's probably having a low Wi-Fi moment. I'll just okay. jump in until Matilda comes back. Yeah. Um, I think that's why, that's part of the reason that it's helpful to look at non-offshore wind examples. Um, so that, for example, the Staples Center CBA has had some mixed reviews, but I think in large part has been regarded as a success. Um, and so I think it's helpful to look to other industries um, when we're thinking about long-term impacts of CBAs and the structure of those CBAs that resulted in that success. Um, so Staples is often lifted up, lifted up as, as one of the, the model CBAs um, in that space. And I think New Flyer will prove to be another model example as well. Matilda, I think. Oh, did you lose oh. her or is she back? I thought she was back. I thought she was too, but then she oh. just heard. I could add to like, and I'm, I've actually heard Matilda say, but it would be good to know more about this, I think. And as de in developing to put in, in developing CBAs to put in more provisions for kind of monitoring and, and uh, measuring success, I think would be a, a helpful thing here. I think some of them because they've often been kind of ad hoc and developer led, they haven't necessarily had some of that, those provisions. Yeah, evaluating, like putting out what would success look like, right? And then holding themselves to it. Um, Matilda, yeah, we go ahead. We just kind of patched in. 
waiting. Oh, no, <laughs> I think everyone captured what I was going to say, just that the, the measuring and evaluation isn't always required and that it's a little bit too soon to know. So it would depend on your metric for success. And also it's just hard and early on to know the answer to, to that great question. I know that there are quite there's a few two, questions in Q&A. Yeah, there are um, two more in the Q&A. Um, um, one is, is the CBA meant to be commensurate with individual loss of income over a number of years, depreciated assets, and or uh, stranded capital? What about floor closure on mortgage assets? Anyone want to tackle that? I don't know that anyone has gotten that into the nitty gritty. Um, I'm sure the fisheries working group in California through the CCC, the California Coastal Commission, is currently figuring out what the mitigation payments will look like and how that will be calculated. Um, but I think perhaps um, just from the practical point of view, um, what often happens is that the community will propose a number and the developer will counter. And so um, it is a matter of what you can win in negotiations, um, regardless of, you know, I'm sure if you provide a lot of information that helps with the negotiations, but ultimately it's a negotiation. At least yeah. for the benefits agreements. Yeah, I think I would add, just add that's the difference kind of between like compensatory mit mitigation and a community benefit agreement. I think that one of them is supposed to be in relation to impacts, um, but a CBA is not often structured so exactly in relation to impacts. It's like often more about sharing project revenues or uplifting community priorities, things like that. Um, it can certainly try to address impacts, but um, I wouldn't say it's it's the main purpose. Thanks, Karina. I just want to make sure, um, were there any questions from before our discussion? I that... think I caught up on all of them except possibly one, which okay. I'll flag now. Um, there is one quick question I can answer in the Q&A, just so that everybody also hears it. Uh, folk, uh, the question is, when do we anticipate sharing the slides and recording from today's call? Uh, it takes a little while for the recording on the cloud to get over to us. We may have to clip, uh, just edit it a tiny bit. Um, very early next week um, at the latest, sooner if possible. And everyone who's registered, whether they showed up or not, will get the email with all the links and all the details. If you didn't register, you want to look for it, the recording will be on our YouTube uh, channel, which um, I'll put in the I'll put in later. So that's just, yes, you will get these things. Um, the question from before that I'm not sure we addressed, um, is while our focus today is on CBAs, have you also been collecting data on the other bid credit agreements in the offshore winds space? And are there attempts to assess the implications of those agreements in terms of equity and success? So we're definitely trying to capture some of like the project labor agreements in addition to the community benefits agreements this is Hillary um, in our work. So hopefully we'll be able to say speak more to that in the in the fall. Yeah, Hillary, you're planning on doing some public um, yeah. sharing yeah. of of information. So, um, you know, we'll follow up too with um, um, if you want to sign up to the Oregon Sea Grant um, listserv about this topic, offshore wind in general. Um, we would definitely distribute it there. We'll always post it on our social media and those kinds of things when these kinds of events are happening. Um, another question that came into the Q and A, um, and I think um, Catherine, you may have had a nice slide at the end that went by pretty quickly that might be worth sh popping up on the screen again uh, with this question. When does a CBA start with a local entity um, after the successful bid announcement or after construction has been completed? Sorry, just trying to get all my windows lined up. Um, so if I understand correctly, this question is about the timeline and when CBA yeah. is that right? Yeah. Okay. Maybe Let me when does CBA uh, start. Yeah. I mean, I think there's the kind of the 
they could be, I mean, people could start, you know, we saw in the California, there were CBAs made ahead of the bidding and the auction, and that didn't actually come to fruition, right? So. Yeah, and we've been told that those agreements, some some on the industry side find those agreements actually very confusing and yeah. not helpful. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, because community is, um, there's confusion among community members. Um, so I think the the best answer is that the sooner community members can start, um, the better, uh, because it takes time to figure out coalitions, um, figure out what is the right thing to ask for. Um, and as we said, the... Um, the actual CBAs won't be signed until in Oregon, it's 10 years from the, I believe it's 10 years from the lease execution date and or the submission of the first facilities design report, which is after the COP stage. Um, so basically right before construction is when the developers would have to turn in the CBAs, but it's never too early to start. There's some more questions along this uh, line. I'm gonna just, jump the queue because it's relevant to this topic. Who starts a CBA discussion? The leasing company, the local entity, or the third party? And I think, Catherine, what you were saying is like the community can start now whenever they're ready. Um, and, you know, a, I assume approach a developer, right? Yeah, I think um, before approaching a developer, it might be a good idea to... Um really nail down that coalition. Um, if, you know, 25 groups approach a developer, that's very different than one group approaching a developer. So just from an organizing point of view, um, it might behoove community to um, sort of get all their ducks in a row, but um, that's certainly not required. And um, <laughs> there are conversations at every stage between every party happening in California. Um, so it is not a neat process and there's no one way to do it. Matilda, do you have anything? Yeah, I'm, I mean, most of my knowledge is outside of the bidding credit kind of world. So I would just say that like for any negotiations that happen outside of that, it's even less defined. Like, you know, negotiations can start at, you know, years before the project is built, it can start, you know, when the project's already operational, like Vineyard Winds um, tribal benefit agreement started, you know, after the project was already operating. So can kind of run the gamut, which is not a helpful answer, but um, I would say you're in a better place for having that bidding credit structure because you have a little bit more idea of what to expect from the process than, than you know, communities on the East Coast without that bidding credit. So. Should I go to the next? Question, we good? Okay. Um, I did answer this in the answered q and I typed it, but um, it's come up again. So we'll we'll address it orally. Um, BOEM is proposing a total of 25% in bidding credits. How can we get BOEM to increase that to a larger percentage? Um, and I think that the, I don't know how we actually get, you know, whether they will do it or not, but I can share, and I think others have seen this in California, from the time of the proposed sale notice to the final sale notice during that public comment period, uh, there was there were requests to increase certain bidding credits, and the final sale notice did have higher percentage of um, CBA bidding credits. So um, that just shows you that it happened before in a, you know in California, um, and I think the importance or the the potential of um, the public comment process for this, you know, for something that's actionable for them. That's 100% correct. I um, would just also add that in California, the Coastal Commission has CZMA, Coastal Zone Management Author Act Authority, um, and they, through their condition, conditional concurrences, they have also imposed uh, conditions on BOEM, which I think have helped push BOEM to do more. Um, and so it, that might be something, maybe you already are looking at that in Oregon, but I think that has also been a factor in California. So the equivalent RCZMA or uh, entity is um, inside of the uh, Department of Land Conservation and Development, DLCD. The Oh, there's Jeff. Jeff, maybe you can speak to that. <laughs> Perfect timing. Uh, well, let me begin what you're talking about with regards to what you believe the, the CZMA ability to what did you see that was 
that Boeing was agreeing to under CZMA in California? So the CCC um, held hearings, um, uh, I believe in 2022, um, actually before the PSM came out from BOEM. Um, and as you know, this um, Coastal Commission doesn't have um, make it or break it authority over BOEM, but they have the ability to, um, my understanding informally is that it's a, sort of a gentleman's agreement um, and so as part of their um, conditional concurrence over the BOEM lease areas, uh, the California Coastal Commission imposed um, conditions on BOEM. And those really lifted up environmental justice and tribal sovereignty and many other things, which have now been incorporated into other aspects of the process. I see. Yeah, okay. I am familiar with that. Where I struggle is to see the link between those kind of consultation conversation requirements within those um, conditions from California, how that then links to community benefit agreements and whether or not California is, is using the CZMA as a basis to require mitigation of effects to communities. I, I know certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, um, like fishery agreements on the East Coast have been kind of connected to the CZMA authority, but I'm not familiar with other types of community benefit arrangements or mitigation agreements. Yeah, no, it's um, it's not a direct correlation. So sorry. I mean, I think there's a world in which CBAs can deliver certain things, and then there are other channels and avenues through the BOEM leasing process and the state oversight processes that can provide forums for people to um, advocate and recommend what's good for communities and what they need. Um, so some of the conditions from the CCC conditional um, approvals have been picked up like in state legislation, which has now set up the fisheries working group, which is going to recommend a strategic plan um for fisheries compensation and mitigation and we assume that that will then feed into the fisheries cbas um in addition the kind of public airing of a lot of um, comments and um, strong pressure from ccc um in its conditional concurrence kind of set the tone for other conversations for example the ccc recommended compensation for tribal and community members who are participating in conversations around the offshore wind process in california and that has kind of raise the expectation um, that that's an important thing to do. Um, in addition to all of the community comments that were filed um, through the Bowen process. Thank you. Awesome. I don't know if there are um, any other questions that we have not addressed yet. Um, we still have 15 minutes left of the time that we set aside for this. So if anyone has more questions, feel free to jump in. Um, or if anyone has a contribution or a comment or experience to share that you believe is relevant to this topic. Just looking through the chat to make sure we didn't miss anything. Oh, Jeff. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I uh, for with the coastal program. Uh, this thought just occurred to me, so it might not be very smart or good. Um, <laughs> but I was just curious if in in the research that you're aware of that's been conducted, has there been any any look for the negative space for the people who maybe missed the boat on organizing themselves on um, being gathered together with other collectives that did community benefit agreements. Has there been any look into outcomes for, or whether those communities exist and what the outcomes have been for them, for other projects that have gone through? Like, I don't know, I just, we're focusing on the agreements that have been put in place, but what, if, what about that negative space? I don't know if this is exactly what you're asking, but one thought is that there's a lot of things that developers do during the process that are not often formalized within these agreements. So like 
workforce development and is what comes to mind, particularly like setting up new training programs and, you know, diverse hiring and local hiring provisions and like all kinds of things that are like outside of the structure of a formal agreement. And so I think you can sometimes miss those things if like your focus is more narrowly on what was in a legally binding agreement. Um, so I don't know if that is even at all helpful at all for what you were asking, but I would just say like the, you know, the universe of an ecosystem of what is done for communities as part of the development process is often larger than what is, you know, in that document. So. Well, and I, there are also communities who have kind of actively said, we, we aren't going to do this right on the East coast. So they would be interesting to look at. I don't, I think, you know, we're so early on and just to judge outcomes versus for a community that said no and a community that said yes, it, it's hard to do that right now at this point, but there are some like that. I think also the Gulf Coast might be an interesting example. Um, there were no CBA provisions in the Gulf Coast BOEM uh, leases um, and might be interesting to talk to groups down there. Um, I think that was just the political reality of that region. Um, but uh, I'm sure environmental justice groups um, on the Gulf Coast would have loved to have participated more in those kinds of discussions. As I understand it, if I recall correctly, the Gulf Coast leases have um, fishery compensation funds, but nothing for um, community or environmental justice groups. There's a question that's coming. It looks like um, Catherine's trying to type an answer. Um, I just answered another one um, about how will we know who the successful bidding companies' names are at the end of the auction. Bohm's publishes that right away, um, so that's not um, hard to find out. Um, it's often in the news too. Um, the uh, other question that's up there is about um, how are we. You know, are there organi organizations or ent entities working to create funding stream to help communities address capacity um, and money challenges so that they can start aligning and working um, uh, and for Oregon specifically? I can I can make one comment uh, relative to our activities at Sea Grant. Um, you know, I will say that we have been trying to find funds for this kind of effort. We know it's a need. Um, we have not been successful in that effort to date. Um, that we have requested them from a few entities. So um, we're going to keep trying. I encourage everybody to keep trying, whether that's with your contacts in private philanthropy, um, community organizations, um, you know, go after every potential funder and ask them for this, um, make it a priority so they hear it over and over again. And, you know, I'm, I'm guessing we shake the trees hard that some money will appear at some point. It'll never be enough, but um, I'm hopeful that that we will be able to to find some at some point. We've also seen conversations in California about how it's the state's responsibility to help mobilize these resources. So um, it can become a conversation between the state and philanthropy and industry about how to get resources to communities. Um, and if that kind of um, political campaign, if, if anyone has that appetite, um, I think it's, uh, it's worth it. Yeah, these are all really awesome questions. And I also want to reiterate that just being here today and having this conversation is step one. Um, and that's why we wanted to do this. Um, and keep an eye out because this is also for Sea Grant. And in my position, this is step one in a long process of getting people engaged and getting people thinking about these topics and how to prepare for any outcome with offshore wind. So it can be discouraging knowing that this type of organizing takes a lot of capacity and we're all stretched thin with other things, but just know that today is the first step. <laughs> and having this conversation is really helpful. And it's also really helpful to us because we get to see all these questions and kind of get an idea of what people are thinking about and 
what topics people want to learn more about and yeah um let's see we got 10 minutes left there uh, there was a question about the like duration of benefits like lasting the duration of the leases yeah that I think is a good question um I must have lost track of it. Was it in the chat? It just, or? Yeah, it, it was in the Q and A, but Catherine put an answer, so I think that ah. moved it to like the oh, answer. Okay, okay. Yeah, if you hit the answered tab, you can see what was typed. Okay, so yeah, Andy asked how in your study of CBAs, how many of them have benefits that last the duration of the, the leases? So, from my understanding, because they're calculated by that percentage of the total bid the bidder um, and eventually whoever wins the developer will have to confirm that they've satisfied the bidding credit by proving that they have contributed um, either monetary or non-monetary contributions that equal the percentage of the total bid so it, it's it's a little confusing so like the five percent for the lease area use say five percent of the total bid um is 60 million dollars the bidder will have to prove eventually that they contributed 60 million dollars either directly or through economic valuation to um whoever whichever communities, tribes, or groups agreed to a bidding credit. So there, I really don't think the duration is less important in the PS, the proposed sale notice, as much as just satisfying that value. Um, and I would add though that often in the agreements themselves, the timeline is over the li lifetime. So it's like often annual payments. So you'll see the total amount, but it's not like that's given in one lump sum at the beginning. Um, often they'll have like a maybe larger sum at the beginning that it's like, you know, start of construction or start of operations, something like that. But then they'll also have annual payments, I'd say is, is pretty common to see. Um, so I would say that's one way that it can vary um, depending on the community's preference. A lot of communities that we've talked to have said that they prefer that because they can, you know, like evaluate annually what needs in the community to put those things towards as opposed to like, you know, getting a million dollars at once and maybe your needs 25 years down the line are different. Um, so I don't know exactly how it's, I don't, I guess, know enough about the length of the leases, but I know that like often it's tied to the project life. I think the total is frozen again. I just want to jump in. I think there's sort of um, maybe three different issues here. So the first one is when um, is the is the CBA due? That one's due. The CBA is due um, either in Oregon, either 10 years from the executed leases or after the um, COP process. The CBAs themselves, the signed agreements, can potentially indicate any duration that seems appropriate and that the parties agree to. So even though this signed CBA is due maybe in 10 years or whatever the right math is, uh, those CBAs could specify durations for whatever benefits are enumerated in the CBAs um, for multiple years, whatever the parties agree to. So for example, for the Staples CBA, it's 2011-11. Um, um, so it's a very long duration. So that, um, for example, if there's like, you know, as Matilda said, if there are financial um, contributions that are enumerated in the CBAs, those could be outlined and specified to end at a certain time. Or if there are like community programs or facilities that are to be built, those could be specified for a certain amount of time in the CBA. Um, so I just want to make the, the distinction between when the signed CBAs are due and then the benefits and monetary provisions in the CBAs um, that are part of that negotiation. Yeah, thank you so much for, for that question. I, I think it, in my mind, I was associating kind of one action and th it really is two different things. One is the fulfillment of the commitment to spend a certain amount. And that's, you know, demonstrated by some agreement, you know, as you say, maybe 10 years from now, but I could see there being very different needs 
from a mitigation perspective or a benefit community benefits perspective. And so it sounds like the there's a lot of flexibility in the duration of that. And I think that's a good thing because it could be responsive to the the impacts up front, but also the long term needs that are, are being promised, so to speak. So I think that I really appreciate the kind of difference between the two. Yeah. Thanks for all those answers, guys. Just um, as we're wrapping up here, I already put this in the chat before, but this is the link um, to subscribe to our mailing list about um, offshore wind updates and more events like this. Um, so if you're not already subscribed, please get your name on the list if you're interested and you will hear about what we're up to. And, you know, hopefully some of the next events we do will be in person um, and we can all meet face to face. So they will be. They will be in person. <laughs> not yeah. all of them, but we we are planning to do um, meetings in, in, in communities. So yeah. Um. We look forward to seeing some of you in person at those. Yeah. And again, the public comment period extends until July 1 on the proposed sale notice. So if you wanted to submit public comment from, and if this session has kind of helped inform what that comment might be directed at today, I would recommend getting that in as soon as you can. You can provide multiple comments. It's not it's not hard to put them in. It's just a little comment box and you put your information in. And I'm available if anyone um, has questions, send me an email. Um, I'll put my email again in the chat. But we really, you know, encourage everyone to get their comments in if you if that's something you're interested in. And Karina, if you have any other closing. I was just going to remind everyone that if you registered, whether you actually attended or not, we have your info, uh, email. We will send out um, the link to the recording. Um, it will be posted on our YouTube channel page, which I just posted in the chat. Um, once we have it available, um, we will send the slide decks. We will send the resources um, and... Um, yeah, anything else that we we shared today, you will have um, in that a link to in your in your email um, or by early next week at the latest. So um, we appreciate everybody coming. Uh, we appreciate um, the productive and uh, helpful conversation. Um, really, lots of appreciation for our speakers, Catherine and Matilda and Hillary. Thank you very very much for doing this with us. I know our community members and. Um, folks who are in attendance here today have been really hungry for specific um, information. And I think this was a, a good first um, step to, to getting some useful information, actionable information. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And well, we'll be in touch. Um, and I hope everyone has a good weekend. Yeah. Have a great weekend, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Hey, that was a great job, Karina and and Sarah, yeah. everybody. This is Jason. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Hey, Thanks for coming. Hey, one thing before you guys bounce. Um, yeah. Um, and we can talk about it if we uh, have a call sometime. I don't know when we next time we might connect, but there's um, something I heard I could put in the chat, but I, I think we touched on it earlier in this spiel. I was kind of multitasking, but um, I think there is a lot of efforts to um, get these developers to work with communities more and more. And I'm not totally tracking all that. It's like a huge landscape of activity. But there's a lot of like proposed bills. Maybe you guys mentioned some of those. Maybe the one in California, but stuff in New York too. And I think I hear it mostly for land-based things, but I'm sure it's all over the map. But anyway, my point is like, I think, um, you know, 
And maybe this is something for like Jeff and DLCD to think about with their roadmap effort. Um, and any, everybody can think about it, I guess. It doesn't matter, but um, like what are all the bites at the apple? Like what else is coming? So like I like the, we talked about the, um, what was it? The Gulf Coast, uh, Gulf Coast lease and how uh, pithy those were, you know, they came in not very high and there wasn't a lot of excitement on either side of the fence, I don't think, from the developers or the communities. And so that wasn't a very like uh, uh, ripe moment for either side to have kind of power in negotiation or like do something that related to any kind of like dollars for the community. Um, mm -hmm. But here, you know, we'll see. I think that I think Oregon might be somewhere between California and there at the end of the day. That's just my conjecture. But the point, I guess, is like, I think this lease opportunity is just the first of many, right? And if I was a developer, okay, we're kind of in like this, um, we're, blind, we're a little blindfolded. We don't even know what's underneath that water. That's the whole point of this exercise. And so once you get your arms around something, who knows, it might turn into nothing. You know, there's always that possibility too, yeah. which is a good thing to keep in mind but you know once you realize if there is this realization or aha moment like oh man well, this is going to be who knows maybe it's more expensive than we thought but look at all these revenues we could get you know like anyway you'll know like what is on the table what kind of piece of meat or whatever the analogy is that's on the table and, and how much of that you know elephant can be shared and what we're dealing with and so i just think that this is like, you know, whatever your perspective is, whatever lens you want to look at this through, I would think, I would think of this, I would just, and I don't know, this is just me talking off the cuff. It could be, it could be different, but I just feel like, um, you know, there could be more on the table later. And so, um, yeah, like what I basically, you guys probably all knew a lot of that stuff, but I guess I'm I'm curious to kind of look beyond the regulatory thing and yeah. beyond the pollution stuff and see, keep our eyes on what what's going on in these other states and and frankly yep. Oregon could I haven't maybe maybe there was considerations like this in past sessions but maybe next session or in the next session after that like something like this comes to New York or um, comes to Oregon like something like New York or something and yeah. certainly there's just a lot of moving pieces and for sure so. Neat. Piece we're in right now is just one little one little stage yeah I can say really quickly um that there definitely will be other community engagement efforts from developers that are totally separate than the any potential CBAs and that kind of depends on the developer um generally good practice would be that an offshore wind developer would really recognize their impact on the community and want to actually have good communication and try to create some sort of trust or relationship with the community so that, you know, a CBA is just a kind of more like one of the legal ways that that can be enacted. Um, but yeah, just like you've you seen said, that, right, Sarah, yeah. in your work on the East Coast. Yeah. And there there have been developers who are regarded as not good. Like it seems like all they care about is the money. They don't even care about the community. And then there are examples of yeah. developers yeah. that have a good relationship with the community that um, you know, put a lot of time into their engagement efforts and really understanding community needs. Um so totally super important. And I, let me just ask, since this is at the end of our presentation, can we in, include this in our recording? Yeah, it's it's recording. I because there wasn't anything. I mean, we're not having yeah. a private conversation. I and I figured yeah, yeah. yeah, I haven't turned it off yet. So yeah, I mean, I think it's what I think it's all stuff we already talked about, frankly. I'm just like, I guess asking questions about how how deep you guys have researched this or like what else is out there. I mean. California and New York were the two that come to mind in my mind, uh, but I'm not tracking it that much. Um, and I guess that piece is like the state 
the state legislation that kind of piggybacks on this topic and maybe requires people to do it. But these, what we're talking about, like what you just said, Sarah, was like the loopholes or like the the openings and the ambiguities of yeah. you know the legal requirements. And, and I'm just kind of assuming everybody's a good actor or like, okay, you know, community opposition is community opposition or community impacts are community impacts, whether there's an, a requ legal requirement or not. Like, mm -hmm. like you were saying, like, it just seems like, and, and I guess that's another assumption, like that you don't want to make. I mean, there's some small daylight there, but in general, I think for the most part, people like to do the right things. And if the locals are opposed to something, you know, that usually trickles up somewhere <laughs> through the legislature or something. And so you can quickly have like a region, some regional support or state support. And then um, even if it's not like legally required, like there's a lot of social pressure. And, and we've seen right. that over the past 10 years with just the internet and like all sorts of stuff, right? So, I mean, I think that is always a powerful thing, whether or not it's yep. legally. But my bigger point was like more on like the, uh, the unknowns of where we're at right now with the whole point of this leasing step is like, you know. Yeah, what would even happen? They're gonna lease like some small, or they're gonna bid like some small, I mean, I don't know, everything is relative, but. Um, so the minimum bid right now for the. What's going on here. And yeah, like, mm -hmm. the minimum bid for the Brookings wind energy area is $6.6 .6 million. And the minimum bid for the Coos Bay is three point. $3 million. Um, and that's expected to. That's assuming yellow. all the. Yeah. Blocks um, too, right? Yeah. And so right now that's also, they, I think it's anticipated that each wind energy area will have one bidder. So one winning bidder. You one mean winning one. bidder. Let's so, see. Yeah. Yeah. So there would be two developers in the game in the future which actually compared to the Northeast and Southern New England, where there's a bunch of leases all in close proximity, that would kind of be to our advantage because it would be easier to map what that developer, like what actions they're taking um, and like kind of figure out what a potential relationship with the communities would look like if it is just two winning bidders. Oh, <laughs> balloons yeah <laughs> did you do that <laughs> oh oh yeah, yeah. The gestures thing i know sometimes yeah that was funny okay well i was probably trying to know that. i was like looking some of this stuff because it was like all ringing a bell like i just remember hearing like there was a radio piece about this uh i think that was a new york piece um about a big solar farm in new york again something on land not really offshore wind related but um anyway just about all the right industry. I think, it's a, I think it's a growing topic, something that didn't happen 20 years ago, surely, you know, or 50 years ago. And now it's just like, yeah, okay. Everybody's kind of like, how do we how do we spread these benefits around? Or how can we get our projects, you know, accepted, more widely accepted, I guess. Hey, Jason, it's good to talk to you and uh, everyone else. We're I'm going to go ahead and end our meeting. I'm so tired from being at um, OPAC meeting all morning and now this. So uh, yeah. let's let we can continue offline, but uh, look forward to continuing the conversation with you all and um, so, good have a you. great weekend. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye, Jason. Bye everyone.